David Crystal, welcome to the university again. Well, it's a real pleasure to be back. Tonight, you're going to give the Babel lecture, the Babel uh, magazine, the language magazine. Um, just tell us, what is it that fascinates people about language? Because it does, doesn't it? Oh, it does. I've never met anybody who isn't fascinated about language in some respect or other. That's the point, in some respect or other. You know, nobody's interested in everything, unless you're a professional linguist, of course. But everybody is interested in things like, oh, you know, babies' names. Where does that name come from? Place names. Why do they call it that? How do children learn their language? Why is it that, that there are so many languages in the world? And question after question after question, and you find that sooner or later somebody says, that's really, really interesting. Accents and dialects, you know, everybody is interested in, in how people talk and the differences between them. And so it was perfectly obvious to me once upon a time that um, th this, this interest in language needed to be met, needed to be fed, fueled, if you like. And that, of course, is where Babel came in. And, and for people who've never heard of Babel, just tell us a little bit about it, because you're on the, is it, am I right in saying you're on the editorial board? The advisory. The, the advisory, advisory board. board yeah, of, so tell of, us a little bit about and, Babel. And I've been the sort of consultant from the beginning. Well, let me put it another way. If you want, if you're studying history and you're interested in historical matters, you can buy a magazine called History Today. If you're interested in archaeology, I don't know what the relevant name of the magazine is, but there'll be a sort of Archaeology Today magazine. And every subject has its magazine, except language. I'm talking 20 years ago now, 30 years ago. And um, language is the obvious subject for a magazine, because it allows you to talk about the history of the written language and print articles about old alphabets and all the scripts that are around the world and things like that. At the same time, you can actually write articles about the spoken language too and talk about how people speak and where speech changes and where it comes from and all that sort of thing. So there's a huge range of subject matter here. And there was no magazine dealing with it at all. Uh, and so the thought was, uh, how do you develop a magazine which, which looks good it's got to be full colour because language means people and places and they're colourful. So if you're going to talk about language, it's not just an abstract thing, you know, it's real life. And so you need a colourful magazine, um, looking good, feeling good, with lots of diverse topics within it. And when Leslie Jeffries and her colleagues here at the university came up with the idea a few years ago, I nearly fell off my chair because I, I thought this is what we've been waiting for for so long. I did try to do that myself 20, 30 years ago um, and failed, you know, um, because people thought language, hmm, it's too general a topic. English language, yes, let's have a magazine on English, but who would be interested in a magazine which might have an article on Hungarian or Swahili or something like that? Well, it turns out that there are an awful lot of people in the world who are interested in articles about languages in general. And so the beauty of Babel is that it's managed somehow, um, thanks to clever editorial work, to balance that interest in your mother tongue, because most of it is in English, so most of the readers will be English language, first language speakers, and yet drop English into the context of all the languages in the world and provide that kind of balance which apparently meets a real need, and I'm delighted to see it. Now, if I said to you, you've got the gift of the gab, you literally have got the gift of the gab, haven't you? Because your latest book, am I right, Gift That's of right. the Gab? How, uh, how Eloquence Works is the subtitle of it. That's right. <laughs> Um, is out uh, this coming week. Uh, yes, that's believe, right. We're, uh, we're talking in, in May. Tell, tell me a little bit about, you know, what is Gift of the Gab about? Because you've written quite a lot. Well, yes. Um, again, it wasn't my idea. And very few of the books I write are my idea. Uh, somebody comes up and says, you know, David, is there a book on this subject, whatever it is? And I say to myself, no, there isn't. And they say, why don't you write one then? And I think, yes, that's a good idea. And, and that's how it starts. <laughs> you know, this happens over and over and over. And it happened this time. Um, somebody came up to me, a, a publisher, and, and said uh, th th there are books on written style, how you get a good writing style. Where is there a book on how you get a good speech style, sounding eloquent? And let's look at all the eloquent speakers in the world, the Barack Obamas, you know, giving these stunningly good speeches. 
whether you believe in them or not, that's another matter, but eloquently produced. And where is there a book that explains how he does it and how everybody can do it? And there wasn't one. And so that's how it started. And it was very interesting because when you actually start analyzing the really eloquent speeches from the great speakers all around the world, you know, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, Winston Churchill, and so on, uh, you find that they all use the same tricks, the same tricks of the trade, to make their speech sound artistically elegant. And then you look at everyday speeches, like, you know, uh, the best man at a wedding, and things of that kind, or an after-dinner speech in a rotary club, or something of this sort, and you say, what's the difference between a good and a bad speaker there? And you see again that the good speakers are the ones that use exactly the same sorts of tricks that Barack Obama and the others all use. So the aim of the book, you see, was to explain what these tricks are and to try and uh, illustrate the point, which I do believe that actually everybody, everybody is naturally eloquent. Everybody is naturally eloquent. And people say, I'm not. I, I, could, I, could, I could never give a speech. <laughs> oh, but they could. The thing is this, everybody, in a small group, like me talking to you, or perhaps two or three of us here, in a pub, in a cafe, and somebody says, did you see that program on telly last night? And yes, I saw it. And somebody says, no, I didn't see it. What was it about? And you tell them. You tell them. And the person telling the story of what happened last night tells it beautifully, fluently, adds drama to it, gives all the story and everything, and everybody's listening like this, and at the end they have produced a lovely piece of eloquent speech on last night's television programme. Well, if they can do that to one person, or to two, or to three, why not to 50 and 60 and 100? That's a matter of confidence and getting over your nerves and, and presenting yourself. It's not a linguistic problem, it's a problem of personality as much as anything else. So I say again, I think everybody is naturally eloquent and they can display that eloquence more publicly if they learn some of the tricks and develop the confidence that they need in order to do it well. That's what the book's about. David, I hope you enjoy your evening with us tonight and uh, I'm sure the audience will hear, enjoy hearing what you've got to say. Bless you. Thank you very much. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.